And guide notification, Eve? Yep. Okay, perfect. Well, hello. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to another edition of uh, One Plus One, your place for inconvenient truth telling and myth busting. And we are uh, we are rejoined by our returning champion, uh, Eve Angler, uh, Canadian historian, media critic, and geo critic, anti imperialist thinker, an activist, uh, co founder of the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and a member of uh, Disruption Canada, whose work is widely published in. Canadian Dimension, uh, Rabble.com. And uh, before I, uh, b before we get to the topics, I have to read out all of Eve's wonderful books, Canada and Haiti, Waging a War on the Poor Majority, which he co-wrote with Anthony Fenson, The Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, Canada and Africa, 300 Years of Aid and Exploitation, Canada and Israel, Building Apartheid, Lester, Pierce, Lester Pearson's Peacekeeping, The Truth May Hurt, a propaganda system, how Canada's corporations, military, and uh, academia and media sell war and exploitation. The Ugly Canadian, Stephen Harper's foreign policy. Stop signs, uh, car, uh, stop signs, cars and capitalism on the road to economic, social, and ecological decay, which Eve co-wrote with his uh, wife and director of the CFPI, Bianca Mugheni. Sorry if I'm butchering her name, Eve. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Left, right, marching to the beat of Imperial Canada. And of course, Eve's latest book is uh, House of Mirrors, Justin Trudeau's uh, foreign policy. He's our uh, returning uh, champion and a good friend to One Plus One. It is Eve Angler. Eve, uh, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's an uh, it's a real honor to have you uh Eve, especially because it's uh especially because it's been it's especially because it's been a while and uh I wanted to actually have you back in February, because uh, because you know one plus one. This is the this is our second season, and it's our second year of do you know you know of doing this topical history program. And in February, February was actually our last year. February was actually our first episode, and you were our first guest. So, <laughs> but you were very but uh, but, but you were very busy uh, w doing your wonderful articles and doing a lot of events online events which the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute was doing particularly on uh, Haiti so I didn't want to uh, bother you too much then <laughs> but uh, so anywho thanks so 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 thank you for coming back on the program and Eve uh, before we get before I get to some of the really big topics I want to talk to you about can you give us uh, briefly if you can uh, an update on the uh, religious uh, headscarf uh, ban in uh, Quebec. What's the latest going on with that? Well, there was a court case, there was a court decision that came down uh, two or three days ago that um, basically upheld the uh, the law. Uh, it provided some uh, uh, some uh, challenges to it, it with regards to the English school boards and uh, allowing. Um, uh, greater uh, latitude for people wearing religious symbols in uh, the English school boards, um, but uh, but basically it was uh, it was uh, upheld uh, by the uh, I believe it was the Quebec Superior uh, Court that uh, upheld it. And uh, so so what's the late so what so what can uh, the People Power Movement do? Can they try to? Uh, bring this to the uh, to the Supreme Court of Canada in the hopes that uh, that 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 it can be overturned, depending on. How, uh, well, yeah. yeah, I think that the even if the Supreme Court does uh, does overturn it, um, the Quebec government's already said that he, it will um, it will uh, it will invoke the notwithstanding clause, which would allow it to uh, ignore the Supreme Court uh, uh, decision. Uh, so it's a political battle. And it's a matter of having uh, Quebec Solidaire or um, uh, the Liberal Party, um, you know, win and win the next election, and uh, and uh, presumably they would, uh, well, they may, they presumably they would change um, uh, the legislation. And what is this notwithstanding clause? Because Dimitri uh, Lascaris has, uh, you know, has, has has talked about several times when explaining to people about uh, the ban, and I, I kind of get blank on it because it's because, because it's a lot because it's very you know legal jargon. So what exactly is this notwithstanding clause, which 
if the Supreme Court, if this if this got brought to the Supreme Court of Canada and the Supreme Court of Canada overturned it, Francois Legault or, or anyone else who's an advocate uh, can be like, ah, nah, sorry, notwithstanding clause right here. Uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that, that's a, that's a, uh, that's essentially according to the the charter. There was a uh, a uh, I guess a bypass, if you want to call it that. I, I don't, you know, I'm not a I'm not a lawyer, so all the that kind of legal jargon, but uh, allows for um, a uh, provincial government to um, to uh, not follow the rules. Uh, essentially, wow. would be the way. Uh, um, it works in practice, and and it's it's complicated um, within Quebec. It's very much viewed as um, the province's ability to uh, run its own affairs, right? So it's it's uh, you know elsewhere in the country it would be framed as um, as a very uh, regressive. Uh, um, you know, constitutionally dubious thing for a provincial government to do, but in Quebec, it's viewed as uh, Quebec asserting its uh, sovereignty, um, and that's the case not just on this issue, but particularly on this issue. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> I mean, it's I think uh, the legislation is clearly a sign uh, of of the um, basically are the racist attitudes of Quebec, which are, you know, as we've discussed previously, yeah, uh, tied into all kinds of historical dynamics. They're, you know, they need to be stated right up front that this is Quebec racism, uh, xenophobia, but it is, it has some historical roots that I don't want to say legitimate it, but make it a bit more understandable nevertheless um it it uh it um i think is you know, cl clearly wrong but uh but yeah it's it's rooted in 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 quite a bit of history and quite a bit of uh uh french quebecois uh um uh, i don't know you know commitment or uh, belief or feeling or racism it's, it's all it's all of these things but uh yeah well hope well hopefully uh cooler heads will prevail and uh i guess i, I guess in the end of the day uh you know we just have to pray that more rational minded uh quebecers get into power and overturn it or at least you know find some kind of a you know some kind of a compromise if a compromise can even be uh, reached then but uh Best of luck to the people who are fighting against that, and then, uh, and then briefly, uh, do you know? Uh, yeah, what what's the latest going on? Uh, uh, has uh, with with Canada wanting to purchase fighter jets? Has Canada purchased its uh, F thirty five fighter jets, or is that or or is that still an ongoing uh, uh, resistance that the, that the anti war movement is is trying to stop? Yeah, the anti-war movement was trying to stop. There was actually just a fast uh, that uh, two, two people who were on 14-day water-only fasts that ended uh, just on uh, on Saturday um, to oppose the uh, the uh, fighter jet purchase, which the sticker price is $19 billion, but the, the uh, likely life cycle uh, cost has uh, been estimated at uh, $77 billion. Um, and that's to purchase a uh, planned purchase of 88 uh, new fighter jets. And it's just, it's in the stage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a bidding. Uh, there's three, three companies. F-35 is one of them. The, uh, the, uh, the super Hornet, I think the Boeing super Hornet and, uh, and uh, the, the uh, Saab, I think the Saab's Gripen, uh, the, I guess the Swedish, Swedish company. Um, uh, and uh, and there's a growing uh, opposition to that. Just actually today, uh, Bianca, Bianca, uh, the director, Bianca Jenny, the director of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, has a op-ed in the uh, Hamilton Spectator uh, okay. opposing the fighter jet uh, purchase. And it actually, they 
uh, it's a consolidated newspaper chain. So the op-ed appeared in a couple other, a uh, couple other their their papers as well. Um, so there's a you know I wouldn't I don't think it there's a growing uh, grassroots opposition to the purchase. It's um, you know I think it's far from being at the realm of uh, impacting uh, the government's decision, but it's the government's decision is playing out over quite a bit of time. You know they've been doing this for a long time. It's like it goes dates back more than a decade when they began the process of. Uh, uh, planning on purchasing the F-35 and there was quite a bit of opposition to that and they kind of backed off on that and the Liberal Party stated very explicitly before they got elected in 2015 that they wouldn't be purchasing the F-35 but they've been putting money into the F-35, they've been making the payments to the F-35 program which is you know, a dozen or 15 countries, it's a massive, massive hundreds of billions of dollars uh, uh, US led but international uh, uh, um, building process of the F-35. Uh, so they've been continuing to make the payments even while they say they're not going to purchase the F-35. So they're kind of setting up like they're planning on actually purchasing the F-35. Um, the campaign that's going on is not just don't purchase the F-35, but it's don't purchase the fighter jets because, you know, it's it's beyond just we don't think this fighter jet is the right fighter jet for the defense of Canada or whatever. But we're saying that this is these fighter jets purchases at their at their essence are about expanding the Canadian military machine and about offering um, greater capacities for the Canadian Air Force to participate in. U.S. and NATO-led uh, wars. Uh, there's also other questions of ecological questions and you know exactly. whatever. But but the thrust of the of the opposition is coming from people who are saying that that this is you know what Canada did in Libya in 2011 was was terrible. What Canada's uh, done in former Yugoslavia in the late 90s, in Iraq in the early 90s, um, you know more recently in Iraq, Syria. Uh, those bombing uh, missions have been um, have been uh, uh, you know, uh, destructive um, in so many different ways, and so the the, the campaign is really a, to oppose that, and it, it's building. It, it, there's definitely a an upward momentum. This fast, these two uh, got a bit of you know, it's an issue that hasn't gotten hardly any corporate media attention. I mean, they, they, the corporate media is willing to discuss the you know kind of procurement questions of like. Are all the planes going to be built in Canada, or is there going to be an off? Is the company going to be offset? Are they going to, you know, provide some production within? We're not going to build it in Canada, but I love the I, I, I love I, 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 I love I love I love the priorities of the Canadian media, like the like it's like that like that's re like really that's what you're worried about. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that, but that's that's the that's across the board when you look at kind of military questions. Those the 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 you know. Which companies are going to get the share of the profits is 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 the you know more important discussion than the kind of moral questions of what are these for and and then if not which company then you know how can there be spinoffs to the Canadian economy and all those all those kind of uh, uh, questions and because they, they get they get down to what what in to some extent what's going on is these are battles between different elements of the military industrial complex right you know obviously the different companies that are bidding. Uh, they all, you know, want to sell their plane, so they're they have access to media, and they're they're you know pushing their their plane or the benefits that they offer with their plane, or and then simultaneously you got people within the military itself who have their own particular interests, be it be it simple technical that plane is a we think that plane is going to be a better plane versus you know that one, but also the you know as you know these these generals and these. Uh, these uh, the military types where they where they make their real money is when they leave the military and they sit on the board of these companies that sell these planes, um, and so you know there's a whole circuit of uh, of uh, you know rent a, rent a general um, that takes place in Ottawa, and uh, and uh, you know the guy who led the bombing of Libya in 2011, uh, not long after he went went to work for Lockheed Martin uh, Canada, which wow. he, which is the F-35, you know, the company that produces the F-35. And it was very much viewed as um, part of trying to convince the government to purchase the F-35. And that's why they, they, you know, hired him on. I don't know what they paid him, but I'm sure they paid him uh, a very good wage for fairly, fairly limited, limited amount of, uh, of work. And, uh, you know, top, top military men, 
uh, get paid pretty decent money when they're in the military, uh, but we're talking about a whole different scale of of, uh, of uh, payment when you're you know, when you're uh, working for these massive uh, massive uh, uh, multinational uh, uh, corporations. Outrageous! And one of these days, uh, because uh, because I, I I read your book, uh, you know, propaganda system, uh, you know, you know, some months ago. And one of these days, I you know, we de- I de- I definitely want to invite you back on to 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 discuss, you know, propaganda and and you know how it works when they get these you know military officials on. But we're gonna leave that uh, we're gonna leave that side for now. Uh, any, uh, my, my next question, uh, is, uh, you know, any reflections on the, uh, on the, uh, NTP, uh, convention, uh, and, uh, and I, and I know you wrote about the big, uh, Palestine victory. I had, uh, a member, I, I had, uh, the, uh, playwright, uh, Dara, uh, Tietzel on my, uh, program to talk about, uh, to talk about her, uh, campaign for Palestine, uh, Justice, which won at the NTP convention. So, yeah. So, any reflections on the uh, NTP convention and uh, the Palestine uh, victory? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the, the NTP convention, uh, honestly, a very limited uh, political utility or importance. Uh, I got pretty heavily engaged around the Palestine question and. Um, you know, the, there was two main resolutions. Well, there's a whole bunch of resolutions on Palestine-related issues, but there was two that really had a chance of of, uh, of being debated, which was the Palestine resolution and the uh, criticism of the uh, IHRA uh, uh, definition of anti-Semitism. Um, both of those resolutions were like the most widely uh, endorsed resolutions on foreign policy by a huge margin, and and probably on any issue that's uh was at its last convention maybe more than any any resolution that's ever been submitted to the ndp convention in the whole history of the party um one of them got debated the palestine resolution and and uh and uh it, it almost didn't uh everyone knew that or it seemed obvious to me at least that if it got debated it would pass and that's exactly what happened it passed with a you know a very significant margin the resolution is is a you know by any uh, moral or international perspective is pretty modest in, in what it's calling for. Uh, but within the Canadian political culture, um, it's a pretty big step forward. It, it, it is a, it's definitely an important uh, uh, step forward in terms of um, pushing the NDP, the leadership of the NDP into, um, into uh, you know, basically saying that we need to put pressure on Israel. Um, so uh, it was a you know definitive victory for Palestine solidarity. There's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, really one of the only useful things that came out of the convention, and I know there was a, another, another resolution that was pushed to get $20 uh, an hour minimum wage. You know, a number of you know, other things that are you know, good kind of good, good, good things, things I support. Um, but the the whole, um, uh, you know, that the amount of energy that some people put into the NDP, I think, is uh, is uh, is very much uh, uh, exaggerated. Um, but I, but it, you know, it is this it, it is a significant institution within um, Canadian political life, and more specifically within you know progressive Canadian political life, and. Um, there are uh, there are ways in which uh, the NDP have been helpful and can be helpful. Uh, there are also ways in which the NDP have been very harmful and destructive, particularly around foreign policy, different issues on foreign policy. Um, but uh, but yeah, so the convention was uh, because of the Palestine resolution. I thought it was uh, you know it was a you know moderate. Uh, I didn't have much expectation and. Uh, uh, I was happy that the uh, the Palestine resolution uh, passed. Fantastic. And at the end, uh, uh, one 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 quick follow up uh, then is uh, uh, so the NDP's not adopted the IHRA definition, have they? Like they've not like officially adopted it, uh, except for maybe some verbal endorsements from Jagmeet Singh and other uh, NDPers. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the leadership establishment, but, but, but at the convention, they, 
the NZP itself, uh, like the members have not adopted the IHRA definition, have they? Or, no, or no, the resolution that was on the table was to reject the IHRA definition. And uh, there's absolutely no doubt that if that resolution would have been voted upon, the it would have passed. It, you know, the membership of the, at the convention would have rejected the IHRA definition is, you know, basically zero chance that's not the case. Um, but nothing happened. It's just, it, it didn't, it didn't, it, it didn't hit the floor. And, uh, it, though it should have, of course, it was the most widely endorsed resolution at the, uh, in the foreign policy section. So it should have, it should have hit the floor, but they, uh, the, the different ways in which they, um, the party establishment kind of controls conventions. This time was a bit different because it was uh, online. Their ability to control the resolutions was curtailed and to some extent um uh but anyways they basically the the resolution just didn't get debated if it gets brought up to the i think in theory it's supposed to be discussed at the ndp national council but they don't i don't think they usually uh, they don't do that in in practice and and these resolutions are quite frankly you know as you mentioned jagmeet singh has kind of kind of threw a bone to the to uh the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, the main pro-Israel lobby group, by kind of implying that the NDP viewed the IHRA resolution as, you know, useful. But his the what he actually said is kind of this soft, very soft endorsement, which is a, kind of enough for the CJ to sort of act like they that he'd endorsed it, but not. But if you actually look at it, it's kind of it's it's pretty uh, pretty fuzzy. And I'm sure that was he did that consciously. I'm sure it was designed exactly for that. Um, uh, so, so, um, yeah, at this point, it's just, uh, you know, it's, you know, nothing, the party doesn't have a position on, on that, uh, question. And I would guess that you're not going to see, uh, the party leadership, uh, considering how much brouhaha there was around the issue at the, in the lead up to the convention. I think it's very unlikely that the party leadership is going to do anything more than what Jagmeet has already done sort of said that kind of slightly implied an endorsement of it i i doubt that they're going to go any further than that because they they don't want they don't want the backlash within the party that would uh, that would come from that so. Inter interesting and i wanted to know uh actually i'm going to put this question i'm gonna actually ask, ask, uh, uh, i'm gonna ask this question first uh before i before before we talk about uh you know china uh i wanted your thoughts uh I, uh, you know, I, I was I, I was I was in touch with Bianca, you know, you know several uh, weeks ago, and I saw that apparently the Leap organization, which she was part of before she uh, became part of the CFPI, is folding. It's no longer going to be in uh, in existence. The Leap organization, and uh, I, which I think, which I, uh, I mean, even though I have my, you know, you know, my issues with some of the uh, leaders of uh, of the Leap organization, I find that I find that quite sad that the Leap organization is no longer going to be in existence. And I, yeah, I, I basically just wanted to know uh, your your thoughts on on you know on that and and uh, what were some of your uh, and and what were some of your criticisms about the Leap uh, manifesto? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's uh, unfortunate that the leap is uh, you know folding. Uh, the the um, you know I think there's there was lots of major limitations. No, having known some of the inner workings of of the organization, there were some major uh, limitations uh, in terms of you know sort of. Where people are at, people that were that were running the thing, uh, where they were at uh, uh, politically, and uh, um, you know how committed they were, or how um, um, activist-minded they were, and, and uh, how commit, committed they were to to real activism. Um, but you know, I think the leap was a as the manifesto. It's when it was launched, it was you know it it opened up a conversation in the in mainstream about. Uh, justice-oriented uh, transition away from fossil fuels, uh, and you know, helped bring the idea of, you know, at a really at a macro level, you know, sort of socialism and ecology together, but you know, in, in much more kind of uh, mainstream terminology than that. Um, uh, but 
but you know there was uh there are um you know so the the launch of the manifesto was useful i think they did a number of things that were were useful um but uh there was uh a lack of boldness quite frankly uh people that were there lack of being um they talked some decent game on some of those things but but when it came down to really pushing envelope um there wasn't much appetite for that um so so yeah i think it's you know it's when when organizations like in, this uh, in, uh, in what respects did you think uh did, did you think that they were uh, lacking in, in in some things did they have to, to now, did it have to do with uh with with like militarism and also and and and, and also oh like, even also, oh yeah i mean sure those kind of things i mean yeah you can get into picking apart the the politics of that and then i would have many many criticisms but even within the politics that they were oriented around for instance let's take for example the ndp leadership race in uh 2017 i guess it was um maybe it was 2016 i forget exactly when it was but 2017 uh, i think um the leap could have and i think should have um interjected into that campaign and tried to really push because because the, the ndp convention in 2016 had um had essentially adopted the league manifesto it was a bit more nuanced than that but essentially adopted the league manifesto or said that they they were going to like debate the league manifesto and it was kind of framed as had they sort of adopted it there were some ways in which the leap should have interceded into the ndp leadership race to push that race in a more leftward uh, direction that they chose not to do for their own for people's in my opinion own uh, political reasons uh, to do with their their connection to the NDP, things like that. Um, there were many instances, many like I said, from you know having you know internal knowledge. There were many uh, projects that were pushed, that were presented to be more you know activist oriented, that were um, either uh, ignored or kind of put aside or. And so the the effort that was put to get initiatives, you know, activism is difficult, even if you have all your, you know, all your crew that you're doing it with on the same page. But when you have to have a huge battle internally, just to begin a project that the rest of the world sees, um, you know, it's already going to be tons of work to do that once you got out, out, right? So, so you have to you have to spend uh, you know hours and hours of internal battle before you can even you know present it to the world. Um, it just makes it that much more um, um, impossible to to succeed, really. I mean, to be because uh, it's already very very unlikely to succeed in in any of these you know macro campaigns. Um, so. So uh, yeah, there's uh, you know, and the the um, the what was unfortunate about that with a leap is that, from my vantage point, was that you know most political groups, their funding becomes um, is directly uh, you know it's 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 tied to different foundations tied to different kind of like political constraints but the leaps funding which mostly came from uh, one very uh, uh wealthy person in hollywood uh and that's not i don't know if that's public information or not but um uh it didn't come with many constraints it came with very very few constraints or basically none and it was difficult for me to see how the people internally were were creating their own constraints where there weren't um from a financial standpoint now maybe at a at an abstract level there were from a financial standpoint in the sense that the 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 people who who would be able to get to know somebody who has that kind of money in hollywood they're you know politically savvy and they try not to you know rock the boat too much or whatever that you could but but in the in in practical sense it was very, very few uh, political constraints on the money. And, uh, you know, so a lot of the le- people on the left, the way they frame the, you know, the, the sort of the, uh, the, the um, limitations of NGOs, of environmental groups, whatever, is that they're constrained by their funding. And, and I think that's 
often the case, right? And probably even more, more than often, you know, usually the case. But in this case, to the extent that that was playing out, that was happening in a very um, uh, abstract way. So, so like I said, there was very, in a, in a direct sense, it was very limited constraints, but the people who were, you know, within the organization were basically putting those constraints on themselves, even though there weren't those constraints being imposed from outside. And so that's very troubling to see because you just, you're just undercutting, you're undermining activism. You're under, and so again, you, you know, if you were to take the political positions of the League Manifesto, I have many, many criticisms. I mean, you know, just no discussion of Canadian foreign policy, right? Just right there, you have a whole, you know, criticism. But I'm just sticking to also, what- uh, also, also lack of uh, of of, uh, of, uh, of 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 transitioning out of uh, cars and stuff like that. Yeah, which, exactly. No, they, which, and which, some, which, which we'll hear the Yonge have written about, yeah, right? There were some of those political discussions that go back to the actually writing of the manifesto itself and sentences that were added and not added. I don't even remember all the details of those anymore, but those political kind of dynamics are playing out. But but I'm not even getting into that. You can, that, there's many, many other criticisms there. Take the text that they had as is, as a, you know, kind of a founding uh, document, which far from perfect in my opinion, but, you know, a major step forward from what exists in the dominant right now. Um, uh, but so just taking the text or the political ideas that are, still just within those not coming even close to f to doing what they had the capacity to do to fulfill those objectives I, I said this before that i i would prefer someone who's who's a liberal who's you know i don't know their big issue is uh getting a farmer care program national farmer care but are like going to like, you know, they're going to work at it. They're going to do it. And they're going to, you know, they're going to do what's needed to get that done, i.e. disrupt, uh, disrupt the prime minister and say, we want pharmacare now or, you know, occupy an office or block a road or whatever, versus somebody who says they have this like, you know, macro, you know, like, who I agree with at a broader political, but basically, you know, don't act on it or don't, 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 you know, work to move that forward. Um, to me, you know, the, the, the person, the, the activist who has that sort of like, um, you know, is a social Democrat, but is going to really, you know, to really, to bring in social democratic reforms is probably going to take, you know, major mobilization, disruption, uh, pissing people off, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so, 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 um, so, so, you know, and, and you no, know, the reality is, is that most NGOs and you know they they had good salaries and so you get all kinds of things that happen to people when they have a good salary and they kind of don't want to rock the boat because you know whatever and you just get into a whole headspace of this is a career and all that kind of stuff and that played out very I think quite um, quite clearly within the leap of um, of some of those dynamics that uh, are are uh, you know undermine the project quite frankly. Pity. One last uh, one last thing about uh, about the leap then but uh, is uh, is w what does this do though to to people who want uh, who want a Canadian Green New uh, Deal and eco socialist movement and tied to environmental and indigenous uh, justice because uh, be because the leap uh, you know as you mentioned uh, you know it had you know it had its problems but. Uh, but it, it it almost had you know more or less like you know, you know a great you know a great starting point on how we can get to a sustainable economy off of fossil fuels as well as dismantling uh, apartheid that indigenous people suffer on because I mean I mean I I don't know what's going on with the Green Party of Canada right now and of course the NZP as you mentioned there's not that much to write home about you know the convention. And if we don't have organizations that really that you know that, that you know that keep pushing the Canadian left and and, and the society, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, where I mean, where does you know the movement go from there? And now that the leap, uh, you know, is you know is folding. Yeah, I, I don't know that. I mean, I like you know the the worst thing that happened to the leap was there were leap chapters set up in. I think at a high point it got up to like multiple dozen. Uh, across the country and some of them really got actually got quite active the one in peterborough 
The one here in Montreal was pretty active. Uh, a few of the other ones, like quite the Peterborough one, was quite quite amazing. Uh, one in uh, some some like high school students in like Nelson, uh, BC, um, and basically the Leap uh, uh, Center office basically sabotaged the undercut the Leap groups and. Um, uh, uh, after actually after having like like you know um, called for them, then once they started getting organized and actually doing stuff, they basically tried to undermine them to the point of trying to take them to basically take them off the we the website even didn't even want to have the the names of leap groups on the website. Let alone they actually should have been putting money into the groups and you know helping them and whatever. But it got to the point where they would trying to undermine them to the point of not even having them on the website and and kind of undercutting the leap groups internal communication within between each other um uh to me this was a you know incredible this is you know a thousand feet past a red line that was an unacceptable uh action right these are volunteers these are people trying to build in their local community you know networks of activists doing eco-social eco-socialistic kind of activity um so that that element of the leap that that was kiboshed basically four or five years ago so the role to which the leap manifesto played in that in what you're describing um uh you know it played it's continued to play a little bit of a role in that process but it, it that had really uh um uh, you know, kind of ended a, a, f a few years ago. Um, so there are groups like Extinction Rebellion. Uh, I know that uh, Dimitri Lascaris has been pushing kind of a network of e e an eco-socialist network um, with some other people. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's different you know, small environmental groups in different cities, indigenous solidarity groups that are doing, you know, some of this kind of stuff. There's some of this stuff around the edges of you know, courage with the NDP or some people around the Green Party. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the, the leap could have and should have been um, that hub, uh, that, you know, could a network of that activism across the country. And and even if the leap manifesto, the main people, the you know, the, the head office, if you like, even if they had all been fully committed to the idea of having leap groups across the country, it probably still would have failed. That's the nature of, you know, um, radical left activism that's, you know, volunteer based is it, it's, you know, you're challenging a lot of power. It's unlikely that you're going to win. Right. And it's a whole, it's a whole lot of work with uh, questionable whether you're going to get the rewards. So it's even when you're, you know, fully behind it, it's probably not going to succeed. Now, if you try to undercut it, your chances of, of it succeeding are almost almost nil. Um, so, so yeah, so some of those uh, those dynamics. But yeah, I mean, you know, people got to set up the groups that people got to set up. You know, eco socialism Montreal or eco socialism Nelson BC or you know or um, that's it's it's you know from below. And there are some of those groups exist. There's still, still some leap chapters. There's some leap Montreal still exists, and you know it. it it hasn't had much to do with the head office, I think, for you know three or four years. It's still been engaged in different, uh, different, uh, different campaigning. Interesting. And on to this uh, question, which is, uh, I've been focusing a lot on the new Cold War uh, against uh, China, and I've been quite uh, disturbed by uh, by many you know, people who call themselves left and so forth and even call themselves anti, you know, war engaging in what I can only describe as anti-China derangement syndrome. And I wanted your thoughts on the uh, NTP and Green Party, its leadership really taking a lead in supporting a new Cold War and a pivot to Asia on China. And how do you and 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 I and I and I and I, I also want your advice on this, which is how do you approach supposedly fellow lefties who recycle propaganda and de facto support confronting or containing uh, China, and then and then a lot of them also you know regurgitating a lot of propaganda around you know Hong Kong, uh, you know the Uyghurs in the in the, in the Zhejiang. 
uh, and uh, to bet. And, and you know, I, I do think there are legitimate criticisms you can make on uh, China. Uh, and there are, you know, and, and yeah, uh, bets. But, 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 but before we talk about that, I want, you know, I want your thoughts on, uh, on yeah, on the NDP and the Green taking a lead in basically flaming a new Cold War with China. And how do you, uh, and, and how do you try to approach, uh, you know, people when you, uh, when, when they kind of start engaging in, you know, Sinophobia and, uh, you know, and, 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 and basically, you know, as your book, mar- you know, start marching to the beat of Imperial Canada. Yeah, I mean, the NDP and the Green stuff on this has been terrible. There's just no doubt about that. They've been pushing you know, sanctions. They've been pushing. Uh, uh, they obviously all got behind the whole uh, parliamentary uh, uh, condemnation of um, uh, the treatment of Uyghurs. Uh, uh, and they've been, you know, and they've been completely silent on the other element of, you know, Canadian naval vessels uh, running provocative maneuvers with the U.S. and the uh, South China Sea. And uh, and uh, they've been either completely or basically silent on the whole Five Eyes and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, they, you know... Uh, they all got behind the uh, the uh, and they criticized the Jack Harris, the NDP uh, uh, foreign affairs critic, criticized the uh, the government for um, for uh, apparently uh, uh, opposing the Halifax Security Forum, uh, which is a, basically a NATO club, um, giving their uh, award to uh, to the uh, Taiwanese uh, um, president. Um, and they, so they were really you know, pushing that, uh, they were not only pushing, pushing, um, uh, kind of, that was sort of viewed as stoking tension, uh, with China, but they also got fully behind this Halifax security forum, which is this, uh, which is, um, this highly militaristic, uh, NATO, uh, um, kind of, it's sometimes called the, uh, uh, the Davos of the uh, of the security uh, the kind of you know military industrial complex mm-hmm. um, conference that's uh, set up by uh, the Harper government began in 2009 and uh, it's actually based in Washington D.C. even though it's called the Halifax the, the actual conference takes place in Halifax but uh, um, so the NDP's you know, got into that um, you know I, I the way I've mostly dealt with it is to point out the is to point out it's kind of indirect indirectly to be honest with you i haven't i haven't um delved into um i'm you know highly i'm highly ignorant about china to, to put to put it to put it <laughs> directly or frankly i don't i don't i don't know that much of the history you don't you know i've, I've followed the xinjiang issue i've followed the hong kong issue recently and you know uh, but but really in terms of uh the subject is not a subject area that I that I know that much about. But um, what I've how I've kind of gone at it mostly is by showing other areas, right? Like, look at you know all these Canadian MPs that have made all these statements about Hong Kong. Well, how many of them made a statement about Canada's role in Haiti? You know, like there hasn't even been a protester killed in Hong Kong, right? There's been like, you know, dozens, hundreds killed in Haiti. And in Haiti, you know, we're not just like, you know, providing diplomatic support to the government that's doing this. We're funding the police force and training the police force and and calling it our feminist, you know, giving 12 million bucks and calling it fe- our feminist aid program. That's 12 million bucks to the Haitian police calling it, you know, feminist aid. Um, and you're s- totally silent on that instance of of you know so so you the the issue where canada has you know very little influence over i.e what beijing does in hong kong you're you know you denounce left and right but then here where canada has heavy influence the the particulars of what's going on are far worse than than what's going on uh, in Hong Kong. Even if you even if you believe even if you take the you know the 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 Canadian government or the American government's perspective, you can take their perspective. Of what's happening? What's happening in Haiti is far. No one needs. It's not a, up for just simple statistics. Um, 
uh, the uprising in Haiti has been far more intense against the government than, 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 in, than in Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, you got silence. So, so uh, same thing with, you know, some of the things with like the, uh, you know, the Globe and Mail or, or whatever. And they're all, they're all whipped up about Chinese influence in Canada. Well, but they're completely silent about examples, you know, where the National Endowment for Democracy is funding the main Uyghur group that's that they're quoting in the Globe and Mail that that is being presented in the House of Commons, uh, that's being funded by the national by basically you know American government, which is in NED is a you know, sort yeah, of and the same thing a. in Hong Kong, and the same thing in Hong Kong. I mean, I mean, I mean, Hong Kong, the protests uh, there. And I'm not denying that there are that there that there are legitimate grievances that Hong Kongers or uh, you know have towards China, but also their own local government. So I so I, I'm not denying that there are legitimate people who are protesting against the state of affairs. But that being said, as you just mentioned, most of the protests are all bankrolled to the teeth no, by the but, National Endowment of Democracy. But th this is even this is even more intense than that. The the Uyghur rights group that's headed up by the Tati, the NED is not funding them just for their work. It's explicitly funding them for their work in Canada. So the U.S. government is funding. It's not. It's not. This isn't like. There's basically no Uyghurs in Canada, of course, right? There's like fifteen hundred or two thousand Uyghurs in Canada, but so it's it's explicitly, and they're not even. This is. I'm getting it from their own website. It states that we're being funded by the NDD for our work in Canada. It's not about like you know providing uh, protection for you know Uyghur refugees in different places. It's it's for political work in Canada. So here you have the Global Mail and, you know, different political forces in this country all, all freaked out about, you know, Chinese influence in Canada. And when they detail these stories, it's like, you know, this funding went to that group that then did that. But I'm like, on their website, the group you keep quoting, the same journalist who's freaked out about, you know, Chinese influence in Canada, on the, the website of this group, you keep quoting in your paper, it says, Openly, the NED is funding us for our work in Canada. Shouldn't we be concerned about that influence? Or, you know, conversely, on the Israel issue, you have the Israeli consulate uh, recruiting Canadians to fight in the Israeli military. <laughs> silence. The Global Mail is not interested in that foreign influence at all. It's just yeah. total, total silence. So, so to me, the most of the way I've you know gone at this is by pointing out those double standards and the hypocrisies uh and and i think that 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 leaves you to i mean i think a sensible uh reader would come to the conclusion that okay maybe what china is doing is i don't like in hong kong or in xinjiang uh but this is way 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 out of proportion uh um with the amount of attention it's getting and all this kind of stuff. And, and politically I'm going to focus on, you know, I think Canadians would do better to uh, spend some time uh, looking at what's going on in Haiti than what's going on in Xinjiang, right. Or what's going on in Hong Kong, because if you become knowledgeable, what's going on in Haiti, uh, the, you know, you, you can put, press your government to uh, stop doing what it's doing in Haiti, and 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 that would have a fairly substantive effect on all kinds of bad things that are going on in Haiti. They would you would lessen lessen those bad things um, with regards to uh, uh, um, what's going on in Hong Kong or Xinjiang. It's pretty 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 nominal, and to the extent that it's important to you know pay attention, to what's going on there is more as a a way of trying to wind back. The, the propaganda that's being you know pumped at us about uh about um about china and sort of uh um uh, lessening that onslaught and 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 the, and the examples go on is you know haiti's haiti's an extreme example but you know same thing i think to a lesser extent with venezuela uh uh there's a lot lot of issues in where canada is right at the forefront and um is you know doing highly destructive uh uh pursuing highly destructive policies um yeah 
Uh, one quick follow up uh, then on, on on China before I get to my uh, second uh, before I get to my last two questions then is uh, I I'm for Yuri I actually oh. I got I had to leave fairly soon because I, I I'm supposed to pick up uh, pick up Joshua from daycare pretty soon um, but yeah so I don't know if I'm gonna have time for like, five, okay then five. Uh, okay then uh, okay then I'm then I'm, I'm okay then I'll I'll skip that follow up question and. Uh, Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna skip these last two questions then, and I'll I'll try to have you back on for another time to talk about uh, Erin Kotler. But uh, okay, so so very so so very quickly then before I get to before I get to this then is uh, you talked about uh, uh, I talked to you once about optimism, and I actually want to I actually want to talk to you again about uh, about that and where does and where does your optimism uh come from and in your first book uh playing left wing from rank rat to student radical you talked about how in order to make activism fun we should be making activism fun and therefore we should involve music and party elements to it can you uh talk about that before i uh, before i ask before i ask you very but before i get to also this this other last question uh, well i i that would be that would be kind of a of a uh, do as I say, not as I do kind of uh, <laughs> kind of dynamic. So uh, um, that would have been more uh, uh, relevant to my life uh, uh, twenty years. No, I, 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 but I mean, I well, in a, maybe in a slightly different way. I, I uh, today, I mean, I enjoy bringing Joshua to demonstrations, uh, for instance, and demonstrations rallies become like a. A bit of a social uh, outing. I mean, particularly in times of uh, the pandemic, um, uh, and uh, yeah, but he, but you know, he he likes being at demonstrations, and as um, a person from the Haitian community, often big brings a big flag, and uh, and uh, a big Haitian flag, and jo he lets Joshua carry or hold it for a while for a bit, and Joshua really likes that. And, um, that's slightly different than going to parties, but but uh, still the sort of social uh, dynamic tied to uh, to activism. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, I think that is that is um, uh, that's not. I won't I won't lie. That is not a, um, a very important important part of of uh, of my activist experience anymore. It was more so the case, you know, twenty years ago. Uh, um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, before I let you go, then, uh, okay, I have to. Uh, a, a hero of mine, James Lipton, passed away last year, who did the Inside the Actor Studio. And in honor of him, I'm going to ask you these uh, these questions. And don't worry, they'll 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 be they'll be uh, very quick. So, so in honor of James Lipton, Eve Angler, what is your favorite words? Um. Uh, Imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> Anti-imperialism. What is your least favorite words? Uh, um, rad. <laughs> okay. What uh, what turns you on? Not sexually, uh, but what 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 turns you on and 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 inspires you? Um. When, when, uh, when a good campaign, when I'm kind of like tied to a good campaign and you can kind of see that this is, you know, it's coming together. People are, the people who are working on it are serious. They, they're, you know, committed and, and seeing an, an opportunity to, uh, to make, you know, some, some serious headway. So for instance, on the NDP convention, you know, I wasn't involved in the bulk of the getting the campaign going, but I could see that this was something that was starting to ramp up in a way that was um, uh, looking like it would have potentially have an impact and that I could, by, you know, writing about it and adding sort of some mostly at the level of written, but other ways, uh, contribution that that could, you know, further boost that that campaign. Um um, so how those dynamics play out each time are you know a little bit different, but so the activism, it's the but, activism, it's really the activism. being involved and, and, and campaigning. Yeah. Uh, what turns you off? 
when there's obstacles that put that are just unnecessary obstacles where people bring in uh, um, blocks, you know, like I, I say, said per- previously, most of these campaigns, when you're challenging power, the chance of success of, you know, serious success is very, very small. Um, and if you, <laughs> if you add internal blocks, um, your chance of success is almost nil. What sound or noise do you love? What what? What sound or noise do you love? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Music, uh, that, Joshua, uh, Joshua laughing, or yeah, I guess. I mean, I was going to say noises that that get Joshua excited. So if there's a fire, I mean, it's a little bit less now. He's kind of going on a bit, but for a while there, when there was a fire truck and, and, uh, the excitement that you could generate around that, uh, he's getting more into the, the music, uh, the music end. And so playing, you know, playing, uh, old song, playing like, like rage against the machine songs that, that he likes or, or, you know, 1990s pop songs that he now likes. Like that's, uh, <laughs> that's well, all right. <laughs> what, what, what siren noise do you hate? Oh, uh, car alarms. A whole bunch of sounds that are connected to cars. I had a visceral, visceral uh, hostility to, you know, a whole series of car-related uh, sounds. <laughs> okay. What's, what's your, uh, what's, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm so, I cannot wait to hear the answer to this. What's, what's your favorite curse words? Probably Carlis, which is a sort of soft uh, Quebecois. What's the like, uh, how do you say Carlis, that? Carlis, Carlis. Like a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a religious uh, it's a Catholic you know religious uh, um, I think it's the thing you put in your tongue or whatever or I I've been I never went to church but uh, but yeah it's a a common uh, Quebecois slang kind of <laughs> all right what profession if you did if you weren't doing yours would you love to do I, I would like to play uh, in the NHL. Yes, uh, you, 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 you were a hockey child, of course. So. <laughs> last question. All right, last question, Eve. If heaven exists, uh, what would you like God to say to you as you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, I guess the uh, heaven exists. <laughs> 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 All righty. Well, on this edition of One Plus One, we were uh, rejoined by one of my favorite peoples, our returning champion, uh, Eve Angler. Uh, Eve, I have to get you back on the uh, uh, back on the show uh, soon. But until then, Eve, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, today, and uh, best of luck to uh, all your campaigns. And you give all my love to uh, Lil Joshua and uh, Bianca. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Yuri. Thanks for having me. Will do. Take care. Likewise. Yeah.